Today we're starting a uh, new series uh, on spiritual practices. We'll be talking about worship today. Let's stand for our scripture reading from Psalm 100. And wouldn't it be nice if we read in the Bible our brains could capture the feelings of, of the writer, uh, Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his, his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send this Holy Spirit to bless us to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. I want to welcome my friends from Texas and California and invite them to move back here just as soon as possible. <laughs> this is uh, not in the sermon, but it happened today and it kind of fits so well. Uh, here we're preparing for this uh, message on worship, and you know, to really, for that really to go well, there has to be a, a feeling in your heart. I mean, you've got to like find the, you got to find the sweet spot, you know. Uh, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and I couldn't go back to sleep, and I got to church, and my knees bothering me, and there were 13 things that were just discombobulated at church, and. I was just full of stress and anxiety preparing for a message on worship. It's not a good thing. After the 8 o'clock service, someone said, I'm sorry you had a bad morning. We still love you. <laughs> I'm not telling you that I had a bad morning. I'm telling you that sometimes lots of crazy things happen and our life gets overloaded with junk. And, and when a, in a moment where we were hoping to feel peace, we feel stress. And I know this has happened to you, so I'm just going to tell you what I did. And, and, and this, is, this is so very important to learn um, when you're just overloaded by junk, is to just stop, just stop and take a big breath and breathe in God's Spirit. Just stop and open your heart and take a big drink of His Spirit. And, and just spend a few moments and, and, and take in God's goodness and wonder. And so all those things can just sort of fall off and go away like they should anyway. And if we can all learn to do that, then that's enough of a sermon on worship and we can all go home. <laughs> Spiritual disciplines. Um, when I was growing up and I heard this phrase, it made me nervous because there was always someone pushing the concept of spiritual disciplines that somehow they were going to make me feel bad. By the time they were done with me, I was going to feel like a bad Christian. Uh, so if you think of some of these things, prayer and Bible study and worship and meditation and what? What am I missing? Journaling, uh, silence, retreat. There's a gazillion of them, different ways that, that Christians practice uh, Christianity. Uh, don't feel like those things are scary. Don't think of those things and feel guilty. Think of those things and hear them as an invitation for you to draw closer to God. And in this life, if we erase all the crazy things we've learned from church and all the funny things that have happened to us uh, from church in our life and just ask ourselves, don't we want to grow closer to God? Wasn't the answer yes? That's what spiritual practices are supposed to help us do. I got an email this week from um, a, a fine member of our church, and, and they said, um, uh, I was writing to tell you that I realized that for years I've been stuck at the visitor center of Christianity. Okay? He's writing to say that, that I've just realized there's so much more for me to explore in God, in Christ, and for years, I have been stuck at the visitor center. Imagine coming to church and spending morning after Sunday morning after Sunday morning at the info desk and never checking out the classes or the rest of the building or the programs or coming into worship or going to the mall down at Independence Center and coming in past Applebee's, you know, to the information kiosk and you just stay there. 
You never go out to the rest of the shops. You never go out to see what's, what's out there. Um, a lot of Christians live their lives at the visitor center of Christianity, and he was writing to say, uh, I am letting you know that I am leaving the visitor center. I am going to spend some time trying to learn and grow and dive deeper into some of the opportunities that are out there for me in Christ. And, and I know any time we can make time to do that, to look into spiritual practices, it's good for us and we begin to understand what life is really about. Psalm 100, I hope you felt um, or will think more about what the psalmist is saying Worship. It's good. It's happy. It's joyful. It's meaningful. It's wonderful. I was glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. We're his people. There's just a sense of joy and hope and meaning that ought to be accompanied uh, with our ideas or our experiences of, of worship. But we, we humans, we have lots of odd ideas about, about worship. You ask most people, yeah, worship is this Sunday morning thing. It's 55 minutes, 45 if you get there late, so that's okay. You know, sometimes longer if the sermon's too long. But it, we, we talk about worship as this little hour-ish thing on, on Sunday morning. Sometimes we talk about a, a worship as a collection of pieces. Yes, you know, um, let's see, worship. We prayed and there was an offering. I always have an offering. There was a sermon, I, I think. Um, there was some singing. There was uh, uh, some songs I don't really understand, some glorious some things. And then we sang that Grace Alone song. And sometimes we think of worship, there are all these ritualistic pieces that we, we can't explain and we don't know why they're there. Uh, it reminds me of, of the story of the, the monk who uh, joined the monastery and brought a, a kitten with him. And during his prayers, he found that the, uh, the kitten would not leave him alone, but climbed on him and wanted attention. And so he began to tie up the cat during the prayers. And uh, I know that makes some of you happy and some of you not, because the, the world is divided between dog people and cat people, but it's just a story. So um, now other monks are joining the monastery and, and they're witnessing the ritual of the tying up of the cat during prayer time. And as the story goes, the old monk grows old and, and dies, but the other monks continue to tie up the cat. Uh, then the cat dies and they get another cat. And now generations later, the uh, um, entrance exam for each monk, uh, they all must write a... Uh, um, a paper on the theological importance of tying up the cat for prayer time. Uh, and nobody really knows why we were doing that in the, per in, in, the, in the first place. This is some of how we feel about some of the things that, that happen at church, but all of us know it's not as exciting as a football game. Uh, and you know, coming up pretty soon, the Chiefs will be playing at noon, and we'll have scant crowds. And, and uh, I've learned that, that at Woods Chapel, even if they play at 3 o'clock, our folks will miss church. Well, I had to tailgate. Well, what time you get out there? Eight o'clock, three o'clock game. Sunday night is six o'clock game, right? They're not at church. Well, we had to tailgate. I know we're out there all day, but that's okay. Uh, Bill Carpenter, uh, Bill and Pam were in Paraguay for, for a few years. And one of the things that he noticed in, in Paraguay were the beautiful churches, beautiful churches, open doors, priests standing out there waving people in and he said he'd go and look and there'd be six or eight people in a building like that. Then you go to the dilapidated, falling apart soccer stadium, which holds 12,000 people, and it's packed. And they have to put up fence and barbed wire to keep the excited fans from charging the field. What would it take for us to feel about God the way we feel about sporting events? Is it possible that there's a place of joy and hope and enthusiasm inside of us that would teach us that real life isn't about sports? Because sports let us down. Let me tell you something. I'm predicting the Chiefs are going to let us down. <laughs> but God will never let us down. In our good times, in our difficult times, he is with us. He cares for us so very, very much. Well, because of all of these human experiences, we tend to see God as outdated, boring, hard to relate to, 
Uh, I know a lot of folks that just feel like they're kind of going through the motions, wondering where the, the real life is. There is real life in this faith. Uh, sometimes we get stuck thinking about buildings and we come into a place and we love the windows or the vaulted ceilings or something. And uh, I, I think it was after the tornado in Joplin, my son and I were driving down the, the highway and he says, Dad, what would happen if the church was destroyed by a tornado? And usually I'm not ready for what my kids say, but I was ready this time. And I said, son, the church won't be destroyed by a tornado. The building might be destroyed by a tornado, but the church is the people. And they'd bring in a tractor and they'd scrape the pieces away and out there in the parking lot we would have service. And we would hold hands and sing and we would praise God. And Scott, that might be one of the most meaningful services that you had ever been to in your life because all we had, all we had was our hearts and our Father. And we saw a lot of this after Hurricane Katrina. There was a, a lot of pictures um, like this where churches were completely wiped out and, and the pastors would gather and the people would sit in folding chairs and the pastors would remind them of the hope that we have in Christ. It just takes you down to the very root of your faith when we lose all of these dressings and accoutrements. Um, I visited uh, several churches in, in New Orleans um, one in particular, it was a, a church about our size, and there were holes in the roof, and there had been four feet of water in the sanctuary, and the pews had popped loose and floated around, and all the woodwork, it was just muddy and disgusting. And um, the pastor showed me the inside of their building and said, well, they hope to rebuild it, but right now they, they just finished a room in their fellowship hall smaller than one section of our pews. And, and I went to worship that Sunday, and it was full of little metal folding chairs, the kind that nobody wants to sit on for very long. And when time for worship to start, they were all filled, all filled. And the choir came in, and they shuffled their feet, and they sang to the glory of God, and they sang of praise and how we're getting ready to praise God. And you could just feel the electricity in this little tiny room where this remnant of the church gathered to worship. And I was so impressed that day that, that besides the regular offering, Sunday offering, they took a special offering for people in their community that were really hurting. You know, for a dollar... You, you could buy someone a lunch that's at the a tent camps, at the homeless camps. And, and, and so I would say to you, sometimes to scratch all of this stuff away and really look at what's really there, it's something deep, deep within our hearts. Well, um, I read some good stuff last week about worship, and, and one of the guys I was reading said that, that one of our misnomers is that we will say uh, worship starts at 11:15. Uh, well, tell me about worship at your church. Well, it starts at 11:15. And he said, uh, "No, worship doesn't start at 11:15. Worship started at creation. When God began making things, those things started praising Him. And now, for all time, angels and spiritual beings and people that have lived and died, they've been praising God constantly at 11:15." We just join in. We just lend our hearts and our voices to a song that's being sung since the beginning of time. And when we leave here, it doesn't end. It just continues. Uh, we just became part of it for a moment. Worship is this thing that is much, much bigger than just what we do on, on Sunday morning. Pastor Sean sent me some of his favorite quotes about worship, and one of them, uh, a woman wrote that, that she thought it was humorous that sometimes people would wear felt hats or straw hats to church in the old days and, and just kind of dressing up with an Easter hat or something. And, and, and her contention was that when we come to worship, we should wear hard hats. We should wear motorcycle helmets. Uh, the ushers should be uh, carrying life preservers to pass out to people. And we should be lashed into our pews because this is the place where maybe today we will encounter God. This is the place that maybe today I will hear something that will radically change my life. Don't we come in the door hoping that today is the day and this is the time that God might do something within me. So hold on. Let's see who God is. Let's see what God has, has to give. What is your experience of worship? What is your hope when you gather in this place? Um, worship is more than a sum of its parts. 
you know, we prayed and we sang and there was a sermon and there was a this. Most of us, three days from now, um, you won't remember the hymn. In fact, I bet a lot of you, if I asked you to raise your hand right now, you wouldn't remember the hymn, right? Uh, choir? Thank you. Thank you. Because I couldn't, I actually, I wasn't finding it, okay? No, I'm just kidding. I knew that. Um, but we'll, for, we'll forget. We won't remember the hymn. Um, we, we might not remember what the special was. We might not remember what Joy played. We won't remember what, what the prayer was about. But we'll have a feeling later this week about what church was like on Sunday morning. We'll have a feeling of how this made us feel. And you know, there are lots of churches out there that are sending people out of church feeling bad. You're bad, you're no good, you're going to hell. I just want to say something to you. I don't ever want you walking out the door feeling bad, a little challenged maybe, a little, you know, uh, constructively encouraged to think about change, but always in a happy, joyful, graceful way. This, this grace is so important because I know a few days from now when I can't remember all of these things, I will remember that in this place I was loved by God. In this place I was welcomed by you. In this place we shared between us something very, very special. So worship is this thing. It's bigger than the sum of its parts. It affects us. It leaves us with a feeling and, and, and it blesses our hearts when it happens in a constructive way. Now another reason that we, we come to church is because there's this chair here. Uh, good pastors have props, right? Um, in heaven, the Bible says there is a throne, a throne. And uh, in Isaiah 6, we have a picture of this. Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. High and exalted, his train filled the temple. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were angels, each with six wings. They were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, not God's voice, the sounds of the angels, uh, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Then in Revelation chapter 4, John gets a vision of heaven. I looked and I saw a throne, and someone was sitting on it. And this is all the things surrounding the throne. A rainbow, 24 elders, flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder, seven lamps, a sea of glass, four living creatures all surrounding the throne. And they're all saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. On Sunday morning when we come here, we collectively are reminding each other that there's a throne and I don't get to sit on it. There is a creator, and there is a creature. There is the Almighty, and there is the dependent. We come to church to remind one another that it's not about me. And if we get tired of hearing that, let's take another turn and think about this. We come here on Sunday to remind one another that the one who sits on the throne is able. That the one who sits on the throne is so full, so wonderful, so magnificent. People come here every Sunday morning. People walked into this place today at this service and their hearts are breaking. They need to know there's a God that's big enough to meet their need. They need to know that there is a God that will love them in the midst of their deepest pain. And we collectively gather on Sunday morning to remind one another of the greatness, the wonder, the awesomeness of God. Around the world, worship varies. Um, in Russia, in the Orthodox churches, there are no pews. Everyone stands, and the priest wears lots of priestly clothes and has the incense thing and they say many rituals. It's not my preferred mode of worship, but lots of people worship that way and it's a good thing. In Mozambique, the services were three hours long and there was singing and more singing and more singing and testimonies. And about the time you thought the last speaker was done, the preacher 
got up to talk. And I thought it was good. It would not have been my preferred choice. Uh, one of my favorite pictures of worship uh, is uh, from the Psalms, David danced before the Lord. Um, I like that because dancing is happy and dancing is fun. And I have the dancing gene. Um, my family argues about this. <laughs> not that they don't think I have it. They just can't decide if I have the Bill Cosby dancing gene or the Elaine from Seinfeld dancing gene. But at any rate, when you think about dancing before the Lord, you feel the joy, you, you feel the happiness, you feel the excitement, and, and, and that's what worship wants to take us to, the sense where I understand that God is wonderful and exciting. So where do we go from here? Number one, um, come to worship. Oh, I'm preaching to the choir because y'all are here. Uh, when you come to worship, be engaged. Don't just sit there. If somebody's praying, pray with them. Let your brain be engaged with their prayer. Listen to what they're praying and pray with them. If we're praying the Lord's Prayer, follow along. Say it with. I just mumble through, you know, but, but participate mentally in the prayers. When it's time to sing, it's okay to sing. You know, getting people together to sing is kind of a funny thing. We, where do we go where groups of people get together and sing? Maybe at a birthday party for, for a, a, a verse of, of happy birthday, you know, and then we're glad that's done and we go on to the cake, you know. Uh, maybe at the baseball game in the seventh inning after you've had a couple, you know, they get you up and you sing, uh, you got friends in low places. But when you come to church, it's first thing in the morning, right? And everybody wants you to sing and some people don't get that. And singing is a private thing. And so I don't want to guilt you or make you feel funny, but I want to tell you a couple of things about singing. Number one, don't let someone's comments about your singing from 5, 10, or 40 years ago stop you from singing. You've got a voice, and it's a wonderful thing for you to just open your heart and sing, even quietly, these great songs. Number two, Sometimes your song isn't for you. You know, the people that have come here today and their hearts are breaking and they're just crushed and down in their heart, they can't muster a smile, much less a song. Your song is for them. And collectively, as we raise our voices and begin to sing how great th thou art, those people who are just barely here, just shells of themselves because they're dealing with some illness or some brokenness in their family, you provide the song for them. And see, collectively, we can do so much to, to bless one another as we're praising God. The sermon, um, I hope you find one thing, one thing to take with you. Um, I don't expect you to remember the whole thing, but I hope you find one thing to take with you because ultimately worship is out there. It doesn't end at 12 o'clock or 12.10. It's out there. It's seven days a week. I was reading this, this author was writing about uh, how we misspeak when we talk a, a, about the church and theology. And he said one example of that is, is that when we say we want to enter the presence of God, or we hope to enter the presence of God. He said, you are in the presence of God. You don't get to enter the presence of God. If you're alive in this world, you're in the presence of God. Uh, David said in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are, are there. Uh, Romans 120 it's a very interesting passage. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so men or women are without excuse. What does that mean? Every single day when people wake up and step out of their home, their apartment, their tent, or wherever they live, their hut, they step into a world that is screaming to them about God's presence, that is reminding them of, of, of God's love all, all around them. It's, it's, we can't escape from it. It's out there. It's in here. It's everywhere. The trick isn't to enter in. The trick is to wake up and realize what's already there. 
to wake from our slumber and become aware of what God is doing out there. To see and, and, and understand that, that, that God is alive and active in this world. To learn to see it and say thank you. Then worship is something that's not just here. It's out there and it's all the time. It's going on all the time. Uh, I asked uh, some of the services and I will issue this challenge to you. And I'm not going to give you Labor Day off. What would happen if every day this week you looked for ten things to be thankful for and just offered ten prayers to God, spread them out during the day. Lord, I'm thankful for this. Gosh, just to talk to God ten times during a day would be more aware than so often we, we are. We can't enter the presence of God. You're already in the presence of God. How can we open our hearts to see? But the moment that we do, everything changes. So I encourage you today to look and see what God has already done. To open your heart, to open your eyes, to let your heart be filled with thanks and joy and worship. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your table today, we are so grateful for all that you have done, so thankful for sending Jesus, so thankful for the love that he showed and all that he taught us. We thank you for his suffering and death, for it has opened the way for us to be restored in our relationship to you. As we come today and receive the bread and the cup, bless the elements. Let this be a sacred time with you at this table. And so come meet your people. Bless them and fill them. In Jesus' name, amen.